In this video, I will sort out a common confusion about the process of scientific proof, then use that insight to present my concept of a conditional hierarchy, which is a key aspect of my theory of induction. Motivation. When trying to understand the proof of a given scientific conclusion, one will often run into a certain kind of paradox. As an example of this paradox, consider Kepler's third principle of planetary motion. This principle describes a quantitative relationship between the size of an orbit and its period. Period refers to the amount of time it takes for an orbiting body to go around a central body. Kepler's third principle is often written in modern textbooks in this form, where A describes the size of the orbit and big T describes the period of the orbit. Now, if one looks for a proof of Kepler's third, then you will often find a deduction from universal gravitation. That deduction looks like this. If you're interested in reviewing this deduction, you can pause the video and go over it. But to get the main idea, you just have to remember that Kepler's third is deducible from Newton's principle of gravitation. Now, as usual, the citations are numbered in the presentation and can be found in the video description. As I demonstrate in my lecture series, an inductive summary of physics, scientific proof proceeds by making observations and reasoning about them using knowledge which was proven earlier. Now, when you begin to understand a little bit about induction, you come to realize that this deduction I just showed you from gravitation could not possibly have been the proof, since Kepler didn't know about gravitation. And in fact, it was only by using Kepler's third law that Newton himself was able to eventually prove the nature of gravitation. Now, not only does Kepler's third law seem to rely on circular reasoning, but the way we see that it's written actually contains terms that come from an understanding of gravitation. M refers to the mass of the central body, which reflects an understanding that the motion of the planet is conditioned by the mass of the central body, like the sun. This is an aspect of planetary motion that Kepler was just unaware of. Further, the formula contains big G, which is an attribute of the gravitational force. So apparently, we can't even fully understand the content of Kepler's third without understanding universal gravitation first. Now, before solving it, I'm going to indicate two more examples of this paradox. Uh, this next example is going to be from the philosophy of objectivism. So if you're unfamiliar with that philosophy, you can just skip to the ideal gas example, which is next. Now, objectivists often think of the principle of individual rights as being proven using the principle that life is the standard of moral value. In Objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, uh, Leonard Peikoff writes, quote, All rights rest on the fact that man's life is the moral standard, unquote. Going further, the principle that life is the standard is often thought of as proven, in part, using the idea that concepts are objective. When presenting the argument for her ethics, Ayn Rand writes, quote, the first question that must be answered as a precondition of any attempt to define, to judge, or to accept any specific system of ethics is, why does man need a code of values? Unquote. She does not assume that the concept of ethics is valid, then state what she feels is good. She instead starts by giving the evidence in reality that we even need a concept of ethics. So... It rely, the, the egoist ethics seems to rely on the idea that concepts are objective. So many will say that uh, the proof of rights relies on the idea that life is the standard of value, and that life is the standard of value relies on the objectivity of concepts. This is the order of proof, some will say. But if that's the case, then how is it that the Founding Fathers came up with a system of rights when they didn't have Ayn Rand's insight that concepts are objective. Now, Peikoff gives a similar, to, uh, a similar description uh, to this problem in his 
lecture series, Objectivism, State of the Art. So you can see that in Citation 7 if you want Leonard Peikoff's description of this. Let's go to our third example. The ideal gas equation states that the pressure and volume of a gas relate to the temperature and number of molecules according to this equation. Now, this equation can be deduced from, number one, an understanding of gases as being made of molecules. Number two, by applying the principles of force and motion to those molecules as they bounce around in the container. And number three, an understanding of temperature as the average kinetic energy of the particles. Deductions like this are often presented as the proof of the ideal gas equation. But if we look historically, the ideal gas equation was discovered before scientists proved the atomic theory of matter or proved the idea that temperature was average kinetic energy. And in fact, uh, this equation was actually crucial to eventually proving that temperature was related to energy. And finally, just like with the Kepler's third law example, this equation contains information from the later principles. It contains the uh, variable n, which is the number of particles, which means that apparently you can't even understand this equation without understanding how the atomic theory is involved in it. The way textbooks are written tends to lead us to an understanding of proof as fundamentally being a process of deduction from some higher principle. But the historical process of scientific proof seems to contradict this, since higher principles are typically discovered later and often with the aid of lower principles. Further, these earlier principles seem to contain content from the later principles, so it seems like we can't even understand the earlier without the later. Now, this paradox plagues every math and physics textbook which purports to prove its conclusions to the reader. People trying to understand the nature of scientific ideas and their proof tend to get stuck between two seemingly irreconcilable principles. First, that scientific reasoning progresses from narrow concretes to abstractions. But second, that proof often seems to require deduction from some higher abstraction. So if we're able to sort this out, it will give us fundamental new insights into the nature of scientific proof. And for objectivists, this presentation will also help you under to understand the difference between what Peikoff calls the inductive order and the OPAR order. When trying to understand the proof of scientific principles, a certain paradox arises, and this paradox motivates the following question. If certain earlier scientific principles rely for their proof and content on principles which were discovered later, and only with the aid of those earlier principles, then how are these, in, uh, how are these principles proven inductively without circular reasoning? Investigation. Some of you might already notice that this question presupposes some faulty premises, and often the way you answer a question is by correcting the faulty premises which gave rise to the question. Now, even if you know what those faulty premises are, you're still going to learn something in this presentation, since correcting those faulty premises is going to lead us to certain concepts which are key aspects of my theory of induction. Now, one common wrong response to this question is that earlier ideas like Kepler's third law are just put forward as hypotheses and that they're not really proven until they are deduced from some broader principle, such as gravitation. Now, if that were the case, we would never prove anything. If scientific principles were only proven once they were deduced from some other conclusion, it would lead to an infinite regress. The highest principles of our knowledge, whatever they were, would never be proven. If Kepler's third law were only proven once it was deduced from gravitation, then gravitation would remain a mere hypothesis until it was deduced from some higher principle. 
And then once that were done, the higher principle would uh, remain unproven itself. So we would never prove anything. Now, let's look at how Kepler and Newton could have actually proven their discoveries inductively, each using the observations interpreted in light of earlier discoveries. In lecture two of the inductive summary of physics, Copernicus calculates the speed of each planet around the sun and finds the speed of the planets, finds that the speed of the planets varies with their distance from the sun. Mercury being the fastest, Venus the second fastest, Earth the third fastest, etc. Kepler then mathematically captured this relationship with this equation, where T is the time it takes to go around the sun, and A is a number which characterizes the size of the orbit. K, here in this equation, is a constant that Kepler chose to get this equation to fit the data. Now you will notice that this is actually a simpler version of the equation I showed you earlier. Now, later in lecture four, Newton considered Kepler's third law and this equation, which identifies the acceleration required to keep a body in circular motion. He used these two generalizations to ask the following question. If the acceleration required for circular motion is this, and the sun is making planets move in accordance with Kepler's third law, this, then can I put these two principles together to find the acceleration that the sun causes planets? So he then made the, this mathematical inference, which you can examine by pausing the video. But the important part is that Kepler's third and the principle of circular motion can be used to infer that the sun causes an acceleration in accordance with this equation. Now, this equation was later changed to this when Newton proved that each bit of mass attracts each other bit of mass. I'm not going to include these steps in the presentation. Finally, it is found that Kepler's third law can be deduced from universal gravitation and the basic mathematics of motion. This is the deduction I showed you at the beginning of the video, and again, you can pause the video to consider it. Now, notice when we deduce Kepler's third from gravitation, we get a more advanced version of the equation. We don't have this constant k, but instead that constant is replaced with quantities involving big G and M, the strength of gra the gravitational force and the mass of the central body. So deducing Kepler's third law from gravitation thus endows it with gravitational information. This inductive progression leads us to a key distinction. The way Kepler's third is proven from observation must be distinguished from the way Kepler's third is deducible from gravitation. The relationship between the earlier knowledge of Copernicus and Kepler's third is an inductive dependence. Kepler used observation and prior knowledge of astronomy to induce his principle. In contrast, the deduction from Newton's principle of gravitation to Kepler's third is an integrative relationship. An integrative relationship of this kind does not prove the proposition it deduces. It was already proven by Kepler. Instead, it identifies conditions which underlie Kepler's third law. Deducing Kepler's third from gravitation and the principles of motion shows that the planets move according to Kepler's third as a result of gravitation and of the principles of motion. Now, what is the point of an de a deductive integration of this kind? These. So let me demonstrate. The integration between gravitation and Kepler's third gives us three benefits. First, since we now know that motion according to Kepler's third is caused by a specific gravitational situation, we know that we, if we were to ever see an exception to Kepler's third, that means that the gravitational situation may not apply. So for example, it turns out that Uranus does not move according to Kepler's third exactly. 
And part of how we deduced Kepler's third from gravitation is with the assumption that the sun is the only significant gravitational force acting on the orbital body. Now, it turns out that for Uranus, this is not the case since Neptune is pulling on it. This exception to Kepler's third is actually how Neptune was discovered. In general, the deductive integration identifies the scope of a, of a given generalization by showing that it will only apply in situations where the broader generalization applies. This teaches us more about the generalization by giving us information on when the generalization applies and when it does not. The next benefit is levers of prediction and control. The deductive integration changes the equation to this, which allows us to uh, have more predictive power about the period that different satellites around different central bodies might have. In general, deductive integration identifies more factors which influence the narrower generalization giving us more power to predict and to control the entities that the generalization describes. And this third benefit I will refer to as augmentation. Once Kepler's third is deduced from universal gravitation, the parameter K that Kepler chose is now understood in terms of gravitational attributes, the gravitational constant G and the mass of the central body M. In general, integrating a generalization with a broader generalization augments it, or it adds to the narrower generalization, which frames it in terms of the ideas of that broader generalization. So we have to differentiate deductive integration from inductive proof. But now we can see that deductive integration still serves a vital purpose. Now, let me demonstrate why it is so easy to get these two things mixed together. It's, there's, there's something you have to know first so that you don't consistently keep making this error, even if I've pointed it out. Let's survey the inductive order one more time. The basic version of Kepler's third must come first. I've shown it up here. Then gravitation comes second. Then third is a deduction from Kepler's, uh, a deduction of Kepler's third from universal gravitation, which leads to this augmented form of Kepler's third. Now, it's easy to think that Kepler's third relies on gravitation for its proof, because in some sense it does. But it is this augmented form of Kepler's third, which is proven through deductive integration. Because we are taught the modern, augmented form of principles in school, this makes us think that we need to know the broader principle first. In this case, it makes us think we need to know gravitation in order to understand Kepler's third. The inductive approach to proving these laws is to first infer a more primitive principle from observation, then to proceed onward, discovering other things, then to circle back to the earlier principle and integrate it with broader principles, thus proving its augmented form. Now, this kind of process is an example of what objectivists call the spiral process of knowledge. And it applies to the other two examples I raised in the motivation phase, the ideal gas law and the proof of individual rights. Let's go through those. In the case of the ideal gas equation, a relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas was found by direct observation first by just doing experiments. Now, you'll notice that this, what I'm showing now, is not the modern form of the equation. It's PV equals mKT, having to do with the mass of the gas. So notice that this formulation does not make any mention of the number of particles. Now later, it was found that a related equation could be deduced from an understanding of a gas consisting of particles bouncing around in accordance with Newton's principles of motion and with the principle that temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles.
This deduction led to an augmented form of the equation, PV equals NRT, which endowed the equation with information about the number of particles in the gas. In the case of individual rights, the concept was first developed by Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke. Locke proved an aspect of rights by showing that for man to live, he needed the right to the products of his own labor. He needed a right to property. If a king had the right to take his products away from him at any time, then he could simply starve to death. He doesn't have the right to live, essentially. Now, a moral argument like this is valid, and it laid the foundation for the United States. But these moral arguments were insufficient to overcome arguments, which eventually came from the altruist ethics. If a man's moral purpose is to serve others, then how could he possibly have the right to his billions when some people are starving? It was not until Rand integrated the concept of individual rights under an ethics of egoism and integrated egoism under an objective view of concepts that individual rights had a defense against such altruist arguments. Now, integrating rights under egoism and the objectivity of concepts therefore augmented the concept of rights. The augmented form of rights produced by Rand is impervious to the claim that, quote, you know, this is the kind of thing they'll say, we need to balance individual rights with our obligation to serve others. But showing that concepts are objective, she was able to prove that the individual's life is the standard of value. And she was able to demonstrate that the altruist ethics, and therefore the redistributionist arguments it entails, have no such fact-based grounding. Now, this distinction between inductive dependence and deductive integration and an understanding of how deductive integration is a part of the inductive process makes possible an understanding of my concept of conditional hierarchy, which I will now explain. There are many great works in the history of math and science which begin with the broadest principles of a field and then deduce the narrower principles of the field from them. I will call these works conditional hierarchies. And here are three examples. In Euclid's Elements, Euclid fought, starts with five postulates of geometry and deduces a great many other geometric facts from those five postulates. In Newton's Principia, Newton states his three, principle of motion, his three principles of motion and his principle of gravitation and then deduces a number of narrower facts, facts about the tides, about the motion of the planets, like Kepler's third law, the shape of the earth, the precession of the earth. He deduces all of these narrower facts from his three laws of motion and his one law of gravitation. And in like form, the book Objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, starts with the axioms of objectivism and proceeds in a carefully selected order, showing how the broader principles of objectivism, earlier in the book, play a role in the narrower principles of objectivism, which come later in that book. Now, I have to note that unlike the elements or Newton's Principia, the rest of the principles of objectivism are not simply deduced from the axioms. But OPAR is still similar to these works in that the earlier principles are shown to condition the later principles. Now, these great works have often been thought of as proofs of their conclusions. These works are not proofs. Scientific proof is inductive. It consists of formulating generalizations from observation, not from mere deduction from broad principles. However, even though they aren't proofs, these deductive systems still serve a critical purpose. They integrate all of the propositions of a field into a single explanatory chain, allowing each proposition to be seen in the light of the more general principles of the field which condition them. In doing so, these great works bring all three of the benefits of integration to all of the propositions of a field. Scope, conditions of prediction and control, and augmentation. Let's go over how. Qua scope, 
let's think about Euclid's elements. In Euclid's elements, Euclid deduces the first 28 theorems from his first four postulates. He then deduces the rest of his theorems using those four postulates, but then also he, for the rest of his theorems, he has to use a fifth postulate. What this tells us is that in situations where all five postulates apply, that is on flat surfaces, then all of Euclid's theorems will hold. So for example, the Pythagorean theorem pictured here requires all five postulates for its deduction. So as a result, it will only hold on flat surfaces. In contrast, on certain kinds of curved surfaces, such as the surface of a sphere, only the first four postulates will hold. This fifth postulate, the one I pictured here, won't hold on the surface of a sphere. As a result, only theorems deducible with the first, uh, only theorems which are deducible from the first four postulates will hold on a curved surface. In this picture, we can see that the Pythagorean theorem, which requires that fifth postulate, does not hold on a spherical surface. So in general, conditional hierarchies identify the known scope of existing generalizations. And by scope, I mean the set of situations where that principle applies. The next benefit I explained earlier was levers of prediction and control. Newton's Principia shows us that force causes acceleration and acceleration causes a change in motion and that an object's change in motion obviously determines where the object will end up at a later time. And what this knowledge allows us to do is to control the motion of countless objects. By applying particular forces, we can control where objects end up, making possible cannons, train schedules, factory processes, rockets, and countless other machines. Finally, the third benefit that a full integrative system produces is augmentation. In the book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, OPAR, Leonard Peikoff starts with the broadest principles of objectivism, the three axioms, existence exists, consciousness is conscious, A is A, and presents the principles of objectivism in an order which allows him to show how each of these principles conditions or plays a role in each other principle. This allows narrower principles, such as individual rights, to be understood in the context of broader principles, like man's life as the standard of value and concept being objective. As we discussed earlier, understanding a narrower principle in the light of a broader principle augments it. One key benefit of OPAR is that it systematically brings this augmentation to every principle of objectivism. Now, these massive systematizations should be referred to as conditional hierarchies, since they integrate the ideas of a field by arranging those ideas in a hierarchy and showing how the broader ideas condition the narrower ideas. Such hierarchies must be thought of as separate from inductive orderings. A logical order a logical inductive order, such as my inductive summary of physics, or to give another example, David Harriman's Fundamentals of Physical Science, link in the description. These logical orders present ideas in, the, in an order that they can be proven from observation, each idea resting on earlier ideas for their proof. Now, in contrast, a conditional hierarchy presents ideas in an order of broader, to narrower, showing how broader principles of a field condition, or play a role in the identity of, the narrower propositions of a field. And incidentally, in citation four, uh, I'm sorry, citation 14 of the video description, I've included a link to part of a lecture where Leonard Peikoff explains the difference between inductive order and the order of OPAR. So if you want Leonard Peikoff's uh, description of this distinction, you can uh, listen to that link. Now, just like individual conditioning connections, 
the reasoning steps which form these great treatises, these conditional hierarchies, have their own place in the inductive order. First, the development of these hierarchies have their own place in the inductive order because they are, of course, inductively dependent on all of the premises they integrate. To write the elements, Euclid had to already know all, or at least the vast majority of, his theorems. When writing the Principia, Newton had to already know about the motion of the planets, the tides, the precession of the earth, and all the other things he ended up explaining in order to show that they were caused by his three principles of motion and his principle of gravitation. And second, these conditional hierarchies actually constitute new steps in the inductive journey that uncover new knowledge in the form of augmented propositions. When Newton identified the cause of Kepler's third or the tides or the precession of the earth, that identification of cause actually taught us more about the phenomena that we didn't know before the deductive integration. Conclusion. Let's return to the motivation and to the question so I can show how I answered the question and satisfied the motivation which gave rise to it. Returning to the question, if certain earlier scientific principles rely for their proof and content on principles which were discovered later, and only with the aid of those earlier principles, then how are these principles inductively proven without circular reasoning? This question was motivated by the fact that the way proof is presented in standard math and physics textbooks makes understanding the fundamental nature of proof confusing. I have answered the question and satisfied the motivation by showing the following. One, I have demonstrated the difference between deductive integration and inductive proof. Two, I have shown that even though they aren't usually proofs, Deducing a proposition from broader propositions still serves a purpose. Such a deduction, first, identifies an aspect of the narrower proposition's scope. Second, it identifies a means of prediction and control over the phenomenon identified by the narrower proposition. Third, it augments the narrower proposition. Number three, I have shown that the deductions which identify these conditioning connections are themselves steps in the inductive progression, following from earlier knowledge and proving new knowledge in the form of augmented propositions. Number four, further understanding the role of conditioning connections in induction has allowed us to understand great works of integration as conditional hierarchies. Works like the elements, the Principia, or OPAR integrate the conclusions of a field in one large explanatory chain. Such a hierarchy is not an inductive proof, but an integration. It starts with the broadest propositions of a field and shows how the narrower propositions of the field can be deducible from them. Such a hierarchy brings all three of the aforementioned benefits of integration to all of the propositions it integrates. It brings us the maximum identification of scope, all of the possible levers of prediction and control, and it maximally augments all of the propositions of the field. Number five, the, formula, the formation of a conditional hierarchy is a step in the inductive process relying on the items of knowledge it integrates and producing new knowledge itself in the form of augmented propositions. So these are the conclusions which allow us to understand this paradox and resolve it. And in the meantime, we have now gained additional knowledge about these different facets of induction and how they interrelate with one another. Now, before I go, I want to mention one last and most important citation. This presentation was made possible by the lecture, The Crisis of Principles in Greek Mathematics by Pat Corvini. Near the end of that lecture, Corvini makes a point which can be paraphrased as follows. The purpose of rigorous proof in mathematics is not to show that the mathematical methods are valid, but rather to identify the context in which those methods are valid. 
Now, what I have shown in this presentation is that this point is not just true of mathematics, but it is true of all deductive integrative systematizations. Understanding the difference between inductive proof and conditional hierarchy is a key aspect of my method of induction. The inductive physics project will use this theory of induction to write inductive proofs of the valid principles of known physics, instead of taking the deductive systematizations that currently exist on faith. This will allow us to reinterpret quantum and relativistic phenomenon afresh, correcting the flawed theories of relativity and quantum mechanics. Once the known principles of physics are reintegrated with an inductive proof and a conditional hierarchy, that understanding will form a foundation which will allow us to discover new physical phenomena. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you will continue to join me on this journey.